Um, so it's my pleasure uh, to introduce uh, David Zygmunt, uh, who's going to talk to us today about his uh, new book. Um, David has been a fellow at the Centre for Welfare Reform for many years and has been publishing a whole wide range of things for many years um, and has been a practising GP, but also very active in the fields of mental health and broader questions of our humanity and the, the role of the organisations and communities as they evolve. So we're going to hear some of that from David. Um, David, tell us about, tell us the title of your new book. So it got a very intriguing title. Yeah, yeah, okay. It's uh, got a title and a subtitle. The title is Humanity's Conundrum. And the subtitle is Why Do We Suffer and How Do We Heal? Um, and that tells us a lot about what the book is um, humanity's conundrum um, is about the, the strange uh, situation that humans find themselves in of having so much power and rationality and yet being so restless, uh, so dissatisfied, um, so distracted, and so irrational in what we do. That is the conundrum. Why are we so discombobulated as a species while we are um, attributed with um, unequaled, unrivaled rationality amongst other species? And I have a theory of evolution as to how that occurred and why. These sound like almost metaphysical questions, really. Well, they, they're reminding me of kind of the philosophy of people like Heidegger and people who, yes, I suppose in the 20th century started existentialist kind of thinkers asked some of these questions, didn't they? Yes. Uh, 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 and actually at the centre of my book, I, I say that um, we can uh, understand what we do, why we do it, um, in terms of four basic existential anxieties that we we all have, whether or not we're aware of it. Uh, we all have um, anxieties about... Shall I go through them? Sounds yeah. perfect. Yeah. Okay. All right, I'll just go through them briefly. The first is, as far as we can tell, as far as I can tell anyway, we know we're going to die, right? We try and deny it, but we know that our lives will come to an end. We find all sorts of ways of avoiding that and forming myths to try and deny it and so on, religions to try and deny it, but we're going to die. Um, and that can haunt us, scare us, uh, determine all sorts of other things that we do. Not only are we going to die, but we are also aware that our consciousness is our own. We are alone in the way that we experience the world and the way we think. Doesn't mean we can't find commonality with other people. We can't find uh, where, uh, other resonances, but we've got to search for those. We've got to keep, keep bridges um, going to other people to, uh, uh, and, and to other life forms. Otherwise, we are very much on our own. Not only that, but um, we're aware of our insignificance, I think, in a way that other creatures are not. So that um, we're constantly striving to rectify that by being significant for other people. So one of the challenges throughout life is how are we significant for others and how can we make others significant for us? Yeah. And again, I think that th that is uh, unique, really, um, in nature. Other creatures want to be part of the herd, but I don't believe that to the same degree, certainly they are tormented by their status and their significance amongst others. And the fourth one is, the, the, the last one that I want to mention, is that man needs to find meaning. We're aware that without finding meaning, nothing makes sense. And that is why we could so easily fall into a state of nihilistic despair, which, as far as I can tell, other creatures do not, unless, of course, they are um, 
separated from their herd, for example, and put in zoos and so on. But I don't believe that other creatures fall into a state of nihilistic despair, but humans certainly do. So there we are. So, and, and I'm saying that the enormous amount of what we do and our mental health depends upon how do we um, counter, um, contain, uh, countervail those four existential anxieties. And our welfare is very largely about how do we help one another do that? Certainly our mental health depends on that. It's, it's uh, interesting, isn't it? The, I developed a model called the keys to citizenship and actually at the heart of that model is the concept of meaning. That, that actually if you if you think about what it is to be a citizen what it is that to build a good life of citizenship and citizenship really appeals exactly to these senses of needing to be with others supported by supporting others but actually that sense that um i mean the uniqueness that you talk about as well and the meaning question to me i suppose i think it was quite interlinked um we sometimes not in quite the same way you talk about, but in the inclusion movement, talking about people's giftedness. Everybody has a gift, but that gift has to be realised by being received by others. Mm. So these four anxieties are very closely connected, really, aren't they, I suspect? Do you yes, think? yes, yes. Although sometimes we can be more tormented by one than another, we can struggle more with one than another, but yes, they are all linked, yeah. Can I ask can I, you? A, can I ask you a question from a like? You, so the way you put it is an atheist's way of putting it. So you 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 describe religion like Freud does, really, as kind of like the illusion we've created to comfort ourselves, and obviously Marx did. Um, I don't come from that perspective because I actually believe in God, but I recognise all the four <laughs> uh, four elements as being still nevertheless very human. Do you do you think? Do you think actually religion offers a, a way to mental health, even if you think it's false, or do you think it offers a false way? Or do you talk about religion in your book in a in a in a kind of analytical way? I don't talk about religion very much, and I'm certainly I'm I'm, I'm certainly uh, not antithetical to religion, and I think that religion certainly helps. The, uh, the four basic existential anxieties. And, and, uh, that's one of its main appeals. But that doesn't mean it's therefore false. No, I don't believe that. I think that it helps, and it may be true. I don't know whether, <laughs> I don't know whether there's a God or not. In, in, in the old biblical sense, I certainly think there are all kinds of um, forces and meanings and purposes that, that lie beyond the human capacity to analyze and rationalize that is for sure or perceive um so i i, I and i believe in a in a in a kind of gaian force if you like um uh, a life force so uh, y y yes so in in that sense i am i am religious um but but not in not in the biblical sense i don't think there is a superhuman consciousness that's keeping an eye on me and keeping a logbook of what everyone is doing no well we'll we'll skip all around the that subject yeah, okay. because it uh, raises so many <laughs> but i do talk issues. about i was going to say Simon, i do talk about god right at the beginning um uh, and, and, and about how it is that humans have come to have the conundrum that they have. I could read you the the the, the uh, piece if you wanted to oh that sounds lovely all right. Okay. Well, I'm I'm afraid I have to subject you to some public singing first of all, or me singing in public. <laughs> but it is quite brief. Anyway, here's my here's my opportunity, um, and it doesn't last very long. And you'll recognise it, so you can join in, Simon, if you like. But it's um, it, 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 it this is chapter one, and it starts off Genesis revisited in the beginning. So it's Ge Genesis revisited. And it's all things bright and beautiful, all creatures great and small, all things wise and wonderful, the Lord God made them all black. That's the end of that. Well, of course, we all know the story of our very beginning. In brief, God created the world in six days and saw that it was good. And so 
he rested on the seventh day, the first ever sabbatical. The official account, Genesis, tells us that everything was hunky-dory until Adam and Eve spoiled God's order, or was it God's orders, by eating the apple of temptation, thus blaming mankind forever for its tragic predicaments. Well, Modern research from neuroscience and evolutionary biology indicates that there probably was an ancient cover-up here and that the story of the apple was a decoy. This cover-up, it is now alleged, goes right to the top and it is surely notable that he avoids all pleas for direct interviews and thus any comment. The latest research amounts to this. God did create the world in six days and it was good. In fact, it was probably too good because it seems that after resting for a few hours on the, on the seventh day, he looked very closely at his complex creation. He could quickly see it was perfect. The innumerable life forms were seamlessly enmeshed and balanced in a way that would be sustainable for an eternity. Yet this brought him not pleasure, but consternation. For divine beings much prefer eternally awesome projects to mere fixing, monitoring, maintenance, or tinkering. The outlook of such semi-retirement for the next thousand millions of years or so was not fit for any god. So he set himself a puzzle and a challenge. What would happen if he endowed just one of the species with a much larger brain than was needed? for social and individual survival. The need for all creatures for food, shelter, procreational encounters. If he granted only to this one species merely a fraction of his own illimitable intelligence, what would happen? So that is my theory of evolution. <laughs> so in, so in a way, you, yeah, sorry, David, carry on. I was going to say, so the, the problem of humans is that we have this surfeit of um, imagination and intelligence. We have far more intelligence than we need to get food, shelter, a mate, maybe to play a bit with members of our tribe. Yeah, We've got far more than that. What are we going to do with it? And that is the history of humanity. And that's our own individual histories, what do we do with our imagination and our memory? Yes. And so the subtitle is about suffering and healing. Maybe let, why don't we look at this from a healing perspective uh, now? Because you've given us some sense of where suffering might emerge, or maybe you want to build on that. But healing is a, is a beautifully evocative word. It's a word we associate with um, people like you, doctors, isn't it? But um, what, what does it mean if you're looking at things from this slightly more like the human conditions perspective? Well, I think there's an enormous amount of evidence now, proper medical, scientific, metric evidence that shows that if you increase people's sense of inclusion, meaning, belonging, significance, agency, that sort of thing, you boost their immune systems, you boost people's repair systems. Yeah. Um, so that's got all kinds of implications, of course, for societies, how we d d devise and, demi uh, and, and design our communities, um, and also our consultations, I believe. What kind of consultations do we have, wh whether we're therapists or social workers or GPs or whatever? Um, and of course, how we conduct our lives. What are our priorities going to be? Yes. I mean, this, this is for me very, you know, all these words you're describing, inclusion, belonging, agency, they're all reflections of the things that we talk about at Citizen Network, actually, David, don't they? I mean, what we, when we think about a citizen, we're thinking about somebody who's connected, needed, significant, but free, um, you know, all, and that's that tension, actually, between, you know, societies that suck away freedom to provide order um, and society, and then kind of the non-society of kind of random individuals. What citizenship offers is that sweet spot in between where life has meaning, but that meaning is, is still very unique, but it's within a social order 
that allows creativity, agency, belonging, inclusion. I think that's very much the goal of the kind of organisations we've been trying to create over the last few years that you're part of. Um, it's a huge challenge, isn't it? Because, you know, the I don't know whether you reflected on these in the book, but it feels sometimes that we're fighting against, well, sometimes I don't really like the word ideology. Like Hannah Arendt described ideology as ideas gone mad. Um, but these ideologies like extreme liberalism are like worshipping one aspect of that, aren't they? Agency or uh, forms of socialism, like state socialism, communism, seem to to worship kind of order and belonging where the individual itself has become kind of completely meaningless. So we're trying to find this different way of imagining society, which... um, yeah, it's kind of easily squeezed out in public policy debates, I think. I'm not quite sure we're very good at articulating the social structures that correspond to the uh, the points of meaning that you've described. Uh, well, well, you touched on something interesting there, which is ideas and ideology. I mean, I, my own view is that what we, we can and should have very good ideas without making them ideological. Ideological for me means that one tries to make, um, I think the word is a pan creston, a universal explanatory hypothesis from an idea. And that's usually a mistake. I mean, usually what we've got to do is we've got to orchestrate our, uh, our good ideas with other contrasting ideas. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that, that's very much what Arendt is saying when she, she was, yeah. she's made this point writing the origins of totalitarianism. So you and her agree very much around that. Yes. But ideologies are very dominant, aren't they? Sometimes in a very explicit way, but sometimes even just at a kind of low level in political debate and discussion, just one simplistic notion of a good value. Um, just dominates everything, doesn't it? I think. Sure. Well, it becomes it becomes religious in in what I think is the bad sense. In mm. other words, a a belief system that tries to exclude all other belief systems. Um, but anyway, g- g- going going back to the, these kind of what we think of as our key good words: belonging and meaning and uh, and integration and significance and so on. I, w- what I'm saying in the book also is that. Anything that adds to uh, these qualities of existence and relationship between us is what I call psychotherapeutic. Um, uh, But that is different from the word psychotherapy. So all kinds of things that are good for us in life are psychotherapeutic. They um, increase our resilience, our sense of well-being, our capacity to relate well to one another, um, and probably our physical immunity and uh, optimal repair uh, capacities as well. So that's psychotherapeutic, but that's very different from psychotherapy, where we go into a special chamber or relationship in order to try to optimize these things. And I think one of the problems with psychotherapy, particularly when it becomes a subject to state apparatus, is that we can then go for an engineering model of trying to do this. So that, for example, the um, the modern tendency of psychology services to try to short circuit the complexity of what I'm talking about to say cognitive behavioral therapy, and you end up with a six um, session program, uh, which is a little bit like trying to put people into a psychic washing machine with a particular program and it removes all the stains. Yeah, So you put them in the washing machine and that's called psychological treatment. And I very rarely agree with psychological treatment because that implies that we can, from the outside of somebody's existence, change how they are on the inside as long as they follow the instructions. And I think that that is usually very disappointing in results and can often be rather sort of dangerous by way of being insensitive. That's not to say that there's nothing in cognitive behavioral therapy that's any good. There are some very good things about 
trying to help people see the irrationality of their thoughts, the catastrophic method of their thinking and so on. But to merely try to change that by a program is very likely doomed to failure. We have to find other ways in addition to trying to instruct people. Yes, I mean, we know from the work of the centre with people with chronic illness, David, that who and and pe- they feel very often that they've been pushed onto these kinds of treatments, including CBT, uh, to their own harm. But that 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 and that the judgment that they be- that that this is helpful is is a is a very unwise judgment, often driven by yeah a rather demeaning view of them. Often, so sure. well, the, 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 you probably heard of this old agile only the wearer knows where the shoe pinches, yes. Mm-hmm. yes. <laughs> and, and the problem with prescriptive psychology is there's this idea that there's an expert who knows about you and can tell you what to do, yes, very much. Um, so. mm. And I guess that this also touches on another issue. Sorry, I'm, I'm touching talking about this very much from the perspective of things that you know, in my work as what touches on what you're describing, but um, the, the role of the healer here, the, the psychotherapist or anybody who, um, who perhaps healing issues of mind or spirit, or perhaps engage with physical healing, but realizing actually there needs to be another dimension to this. Mm. But it is problematic, isn't it? Because in, in a sense, the dominant vision of healing is very much the external healer and the treatment um you know i I sometimes joke that doctors are basically registered and controlled because basically they're just doing organized poisoning and organized assault and battery because that's basically what doctoring is isn't it it's cutting you up or in in ways that you wouldn't normally allow people to do or it's giving you poisons that people and we we control those things but actually the idea of health has become very instrumental and increasingly, and this is a kind of slightly separate but connected thought, social policy is now trying to partially to address some of the things you're describing, but what it does is then it says to the doctor, oh, well, you've now got to do social prescribing. You've got to help people make connections. And it's putting an awful lot of weight on the doctor at, particularly at a time when doctors themselves are living in a very pressured, um, you know, time, time frozen oh. kind of environment. I don't know. See, it's a very strange thing going on in society at the moment, addressing these issues. Well, again, the, I mean, the problem is it's, it's prescriptive. I mean, they're talking about social prescribing. Now, I agree that, that as with so many of the reforms in the last 30 years, I might agree with the mission, what they say they want to achieve, but I don't agree with the method. I don't think the way to get people better integrated, um, healthier in their lifestyles and so on, is to tell them what to do and plug them into another agency. I think a far better way is through um, a bespoke relationship with them. In other words, because you've grown to understand them, either by having a very good interview with them right now or because of several previous um, uh, conversations you've had with them. You understand what sort of person this is, what they're struggling with, what they're scared of, what they hope for, what makes them laugh, what gives them pleasure and so on. And then you can guide them by suggestion. You can explore with them rather than saying, oh, well, you know, you're obviously very lonely. I'm going to refer you to a befrienders group or I'm going to send you to a day centre or I'm going to sign you up for, you know, you seem to be artistic. I'm going to send you to some, going to give you six sessions of art classes or something. I don't think that's the way to do it because it's prescriptive. And this is one of the problems with with medicine. It very easily... Um, gravitates to didacticism, to knowing best, to telling people what to do, where to go. And of course that is necessary sometimes. You know, if you have appendicitis, um, it it is not a good consultation. If I um, have a humanistic 
kind of holistic kind of interview with you and say, well, how do you feel about this? And what, what's your, what, 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 what would you most like now? You know, no, of course not. There are times when we, when we must be didactic, but the problem is didacticism has become, as it were, the, the anchor model of uh, medical discourse. That, that's always been my dispute, actually. Yes, yes. Well, and in my my work, David, I suppose this the thing agency, but also belonging and meaning, uh, are very intimately connected. I think. I mean, I think it's you know we find meaning in the things we do and in the relationships we discover. It's almost impossible for an outsider, which a health professional almost always is, mm. to to do very much good in that space other than to facilitate the right kind of opportunities for people um, and freedoms and resources. And, but most of this journey really is just out is happens outside the chamber. If you use your metaphor, Um, it happens in life. It happens in the community. The chamber uh, opens up maybe certain doors for understanding yourself, but um, actually then to find a better way forward happens in life and life is a complex stream into which we we must immerse ourselves if we're going to uh, as it were benefit from it isn't it so yes it's a i mean that's why we be, things like personal budgets and all these other mechanisms which can become rather <laughs> horrific and bureaucratic themselves actually but the the goal was just to free people up to go on that journey themselves well i mean i I'm thinking as you're talking. I'm thinking of a of, of a greenhouse, you know, where you can where you can grow seeds and pot them and so on. But then eventually, you might you might put them in the garden. So in in a way, a good consultation can be a bit like a a greenhouse where we can help people plant things. But then, of course, whether or not that plant is going to survive depends upon whether they can take it outside and put it in the garden in a suitable place. And yeah. and that's of course their. But you, it, uh, using that metaphor, that is their life, the outside. Yes. Well, on, in terms of the thinking about healing, but in the terms of the four, I know they, they probably all overlap, but if the four anxieties, I'd quite like you to go back to the very first one, the anxiety about death. Um, what are your reflections about, in a sense, what we do do about that, the ultimate anxiety? I mean, in a sense, yeah, I don't... I. I mean, we we I think lives do have meaning, but I mean, obviously that is, a, and in a sense, I don't think it's even that mysterious how we we get meaning. And if you ask people about that, but you're talking here about yes, an ultimate kind of fact about our existence, a source of anxiety. What is what is, what are we to do about that as humans? I think the only adequate response to the fact that we know that we are going to, that we have to die, is to involve ourselves in life and invest in both our life and the life of people around us. And of course, as we get older, investing in the life around us becomes more and more important. And that's one of the reasons why um, when people get older, uh, their connection to younger people becomes more and more important. That's the only adequate uh, uh, account of valence to um, this this fear, this terror of death. The more we're involved in life, the more we're involved in the life of other people, the less terror and fear death has for us. And I've often observed that the people who spend their life being haunted by the, the, the fact that they might die will die, of course, but that they, they're afraid they might die, are the people who are very afraid of really investing in their own or other people's lives. Wow, that's that's a lot to think about, isn't it? That mm. seems very true and I, when you say it like that and actually kind of mirrors things I can see, but I hadn't, it hadn't struck me quite like that. Yeah, so this, the solution for death is life. That's right. That's <laughs> even, right. Though, even though death is inevitable, the cure for death is life. Mm. Uh, to invest I've, in I've it, to commit seen to that, it. Yes, I've often seen that the people who most serenely die are those who have made 
good investments in other people's lives, other connections, and invested in their own life, they can let go of their own. But it's so difficult to let go of something that we've never really grasped. Gosh, yes. The real paradox. Yeah. Yes, okay, right. Well, I will avoid going further into religious parallels of the questions because that, that would be interesting as well. So t- tell talk about so you've set up the the anxieties at the heart of the book, and you're talking about some of the th- therapeutic where else does the book go in a sense? What's the where's the direction of the book? What what what's the reader going to Well, I, 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 I look, for example, at, at how mental illnesses really are um about our inability to make creative use of our excessive memory and our excessive imagination. So memory and imagination are all, are both concerned with what is not there, yeah? So memory is about things that no longer exist, yeah? So they are our hauntings, our guilts, our shames, our regrets, our uh, self-flagellations, yes, uh, sometimes our conscience, yeah. And it, imagination is, of course, of what if, yes, and, and, and could it be that, yeah. Now, both of these things can lead to the highest art forms and the greatest reverence for life, but they can also be our enormous haunting. So, too much memory is often depression and too much imagination is anxiety yeah anxiety is not about what's actually happening anxiety is about what might happen what could happen yeah um and of course too much imagination can lead not just to anxiety what might happen what if but It's when that imagination is so great that we can no longer distinguish it from what is actually happening now, right? So that's psychosis. When we believe that uh, what we have imagined is real, that's psychosis. So I look at mental illness from that point, from, from those models as well. I mean, that's fascinating, David, and very helpful, I think. I mean... I mean, and it's interesting, like as a philosopher, I think it's interesting that to restore words like memory and imagination, which are, as it, as it were, fundamental aspects of consciousness, which uh, we all, I think everybody can find a handle on those terms. And uh, But when you mention, make a word like, use a word, a medical word like psychosis, now, as it were, as a human being, one starts to feel you've lost control of the discourse or the conversation. You're you're in the hands of people who are labelling you, aren't you? Really, and mm-hmm. um, and and again, I'm not I'm not suggesting the word's a bad word, but it it is fascinating how these yeah these mental illnesses have become things without explanation. Upon, and then we, we're told, oh, well, you need this set of drugs or you need this therapy or, mm-hmm. you know, or you need to be in this kind of psychodynamic relationship. Or, and then there's a market for these different products, whereas we don't talk about these things as actually just fundamental aspects of human existence. You know, things we could talk about at primary school in a sure. way. Yeah, well, I, I, I do. I always have, actually. And by the way, in your introduction... Um, you, you said that I was, I was a GP. I was a GP, but I was also I've also been a psychiatrist for fifty years. I, I did the two alongside one another, so I worked in psychiatry all those years as well. But you know, psychosis, for example, uh, it, very often I find that the 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 better longer term help comes not just from drugs. Yes, sometimes drugs are helpful in, in quietening um, the 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 torment of not there because psychosis is being tormented by what is not there. It's not what's actually happening. It's what the person imagines could happen and therefore is happening in their head. It's, it's, it's not just a matter of quietening it so that it's less distressing with drugs. It's a matter of 
trying to help the person understand and assimilate what it is that they've been unable to integrate in their own experience. Usually, if I've got to know people well enough, that's been a helpful approach to helping them cope with these torments of what I call the not theirs. Humans are, I mean, other animals seem to have very limited capacity to conceive of what is not there, a tiny bit, but not very much. But humans can often spend more time dealing with what's not there than what is there. I mean, we could say that this is a, a, a real blight of humanity now, that we spend more time, for example, looking on screens and considering fictions and considering things that are remote and alleged and represented on our devices and so on, than what's actually here that we can deal with in front of us. Mm -hmm. And a, a, a lot of human difficulties come from that, I think. Mm -hmm. So what do you think, I mean, is the book targeted at um, the general reader, would you say? Is it for a book for everybody, David? Or is this a book for people in, in the healing professions? Who, who's your ideal reader? Um, okay, you know, it, 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 it is not for specialists. It is not for people in the caring professions or the psychotherapies or the, the med no, no, that's not what it's about. It's for anybody who is puzzled by human anguish and human miscreants. I mean, why are we so violent? Why are we so restless? Why are we so tormented by what we imagine? Yeah. Anybody who's interested in those questions, I think will find this book interesting. Fantastic. And what do you think, do if, and then for the individual reader thinking about their own lives, I mean, you've hinted at some of this, but maybe you want to just spell it out a little bit, you know, and again, I know that this may be asking you to simplify what can't be simplified, but in a sense, some of the things you're saying, they, they speak to the individual life journey, don't they, that we're all on. What would you yeah. say the kind of lessons for human beings from these reflections might be? Uh, at an individual level? I think it's about getting us to be more reflective, both with ourselves and with other people, about seeing that actually we are, because we're human, we're all scared, right? And we're all in some ways lonely, right? And once you understand that, um, ourselves and other people in a way become more more tolerable <laughs> i find that you know because i i can understand better why it is that people respond in the way that they do mm. yeah if we imagine our prime minister as fundamentally a scared lonely human being well, maybe I, think, I, think, <laughs> I, think it, I think it's true of all of us that doesn't excuse it right no. that doesn't it. No, but it does help explain it. Yes, yes. And, and, and the whole populations, I mean, you look at the most terrible things that have happened in, 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 in the last century, which is pretty well documented, everything from, from what happened in Cambodia to Nazi Germany, what might be going on in Afghanistan now and so on. And it's all about this kind of stuff, about how do humans invent all this stuff that is not there, right, in their heads, and then try and quell it. And one of the tragic things, of course, is that often we, because of our lack of insight into these things, our lack of therefore being able to contain it, is we project it into other people. So, for example, one of the reasons why people, why whole populations can go on bloodlusts, I believe, in other words, you get these terrible uh, contagions of violence is because momentarily people then feel like gods. They feel that they are not the receivers of death, they are the dispensers of death. And that's one of the reasons why these terrible things happen. And that's 
I imagine one of the reasons why people can take sadistic delight in controlling and taking the lives of others. I mean, we're going into pretty dark places here, but I, I touch on it in the book. It reminds me, actually, I think I, I saw a, an article about um, from Rwanda, where there was a genocidal kind of um, mm. attack on people. And in the, uh, the local people, I think, were rejecting Western psychotherapists because they felt that they were actually their whole approach was wrong. That, that they weren't, as it were, helping people reconnect, I think, but they felt it was the whole, actually the culture of it, taking people into darkened rooms to have conversations wasn't the culture of that community. Mm. Um, and uh, so the, these, so sorry, that might be an inappropriate connection, but it seems that's part of our, you know, the West is in an interesting position here, isn't it? Because we've, you know, modern European societies, as we think of them, have probably done more murderous acts or caused more murder. <laughs> you know, if we really think about Nazi Germany and Stalin and communism and all of these forces, this is when we get into multi-million people murdering. And this is in the so-called advanced world, isn't it? So there's this mm -hmm. kind of complete mismatch between. Well, I mean, we can, yeah. I mean, we, I mean, the thing about modern modern societies is we have the technology to mass produce um, all aspects of human nature, both good yeah. and bad. Yes. Yeah. No, that's right. Wow. I, I think one of the things. So this might be a trivial response as well. But when you were talking about that, it made it reminded me of that. You know that kind of rather hackney thing where people say, "Well, if you're nervous going into, say, doing public speaking, just imagine all your audience naked." It seems to me that one level you're saying, like, if you can actually appreciate that, well, we are spiritually naked. Uh, actually, it's a bit that actually that helps us not demean others, but actually recognize each other as all sharing this kind of common experience it's all we're all fundamentally captured by these anxieties making the best we can out of life in the context of these anxieties maybe if we could talk about it and recognize it it would help us individually but also collectively to um to grow up maybe or to to help each other grow up uh, in a in a better way right although in some ways what we've got to do is grow back as well as grow up in other mm. words we have to reconnect with yes. where we've come from um it, 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 in in terms of nature in terms of of uh, I mean, one of the reasons why people like having a dog. You don't have a dog, do you? No. No, no. Okay, okay. People who have dogs, I don't have a dog either. People who have dogs get an enormous amount of comfort from the simplicity of of the creature in a way that that, that it has no agenda, right? It's not. It isn't obsessed with what isn't there, with what used to happen, right? Yes, it has its habits and so on, but it doesn't have, doesn't bear grievances. It's not going to have a grudge against you and so on. Um, and it, it, it takes pleasure in whatever is there. It appreciates whatever is there. And if it's in pain or it's hungry and so on, it will protest. And when that is dealt with, it will be satisfied. And one of the satisfactions of having a dog is it takes us back to that place to help us live in the present with what is actually here rather than what we think ought to be here or what was here or what might be here yeah yeah so that's what i mean by that's what we got to do by growing back and in a way that's what um various schools of spiritual enlightenment talk about isn't it about being in the here and now yes yes and one way i think about sorry that but my model of the keys to citizenship is that we the, these elements, which include things like having a home and uh, having help and having money and having freedom and, and having a life in community, I think of them as clothes. So, so it's almost what we need to do in our relationships with each other is ensure that everybody is, is clothed in, in the garments of citizenship, because actually uh, that helps us connect to respect um, at some level. So... I mean, it seems a 
maybe that's a funny jump, but it's, yes, in social policy terms um, and in the way that social structures are developed, one of the dangers of the modern world is that is the distances we create between ourselves that allow, um, that then cause anxiety and stress and unhappiness. Um, and so we, are, we, in a sense, as a society, we have to make sure everybody is clothed in citizenship, I think. Is sure. that... and, I, I, and I think it is, I think it is very complex because I think some of the advances, I don't deal with this in the book, by the way, but I'll say it now, that I think that some of the advances in technology that we now all depend upon, including what we're doing now, um, can actually make our relationships more difficult, more remote, more and more things become remote, automated, cybernated, um, uh, uh, subject to algorithms and so on. And that can destroy our citizenship. Yes. You yes. know, the closure of the bank, the fact that there isn't a receptionist at your GP surgery. Yes. That you ring up your uh, a gas provider and you can't talk to a person, you only speak to a robot and so on. These things, I think, deplete our sense of community and citizenship. And I think we have to be very careful how we unleash these things. Not everything that is made remote and uh, cybernated is necessarily good for us. No, and it's interesting actually. This morning, when we're doing this interview, uh, we just launched the Neighborhood Democracy Movement new website with new members, David, and all all of that is about actually building local community power. In a sense, what we're and I think this is partly a function of what you're describing as well, because I think people are hungry for meaning, connection, mm -hmm. relationships, um, and a lot of the things that we've put we've lent on in the past to, to have some sense of that are disappearing through digital technologies. Mm. Um, mm. Actually, that still leaves plenty of space, even if the digital technologies develop in the way they're likely to, there's plenty of space, but it's all much more local, I think. <laughs> or at least, you know, I think there's a lot of space at the local level that we're not occupying, where our neighbourhoods, for instance, have just been, in a sense, lacking in ownership in involvement and so our lives have been rather attenuated i think in the kind of 20th 21st century going to the job many miles away from where you live or going you know working in an automated way under other people's commands i think there's a positive possibility in this future because i think that we could easily find new opportunities for meaning together but not in the style of the 19th and 20th century, um, you know, in much more in harmony with nature and each other, but at a different scale to the scale that we've been thinking about, um, I think. Anyway, that may or may not be true. Let me, th <laughs> so let's end by asking, me asking you a question, David, which is like, I mean, there's probably a hundred questions I should have asked you, but if there was one question you wished I'd asked you, because perhaps you think it's critical to understanding the book. What would that be? What would you want people really to maybe go away and think about or uh, intrigue them to buy the book and explore further? Oh, gosh, I wish you'd asked me this question before. <laughs> <laughs> well, we can go. Oh, there's no yeah. six times. Okay, well, here is, OK, I, I'll hold the book up. Can you see it? Is that, does it, oh, there yeah, back there. But we'll put a link to this in the okay, so YouTube film now, and everything. So I've, I've shown it to you. Um, <laughs> uh, the, the subtitle of the book is Why is Homo sapiens both so gifted with such reason and yet sir, uh, cursed with such turbulent restlessness? And, and that really is um, at the heart of the book and, and what we can do about it. Um, what we can do about it, and I, I don't deal with it in a manifesto kind of way. Um, I don't come up with 173 things that we ought to be doing as a society, but I just talk about the general tendency of how we might better think about things, both for ourselves and for communities. 
So is that not your question? I think. Well, I think so, and I think that I think that's what we've been talking about mm. as well. So I think it, um, it's been fascinating talking to you, David, as always. I think that um, I'm looking forward to reading the book, which I haven't had a chance to do in the manic, the manicness, the restless mm. manicness of my life. Um, but I, it does seem to sing so true. Uh, in relationship to all the things that I'm experiencing, both personally and in terms of all the work that Citizen Network is involved in around the world and the and the the big challenges I think we face. I think if we could address some of these things from the direction you're coming, that would really help open people's people's minds. And I can think of all sorts of people who whose kind of starting point may be slightly different, whether thinking about um, social systems, whether they're thinking about community citizenship, whether they're thinking about mental health, or the, all the other, and many, many other angles as well, where the meet, there's a meeting point in your work. There's a point where we could all really start to explore, oh yes, gosh, that is what life's about, isn't it? And Yeah, I think, I, I, well, I've certainly taken on themes that are very universal, um, I think it's a very readable book, and it's short. It's only 100 pages. <laughs> Always a selling point. All right. So, well, again, I'm going to thank you, David. There will be um, details in both on the YouTube account and on the Citizen Network page where this uh, film will be embedded about how to buy David's book. Um, I hope you do, and uh, please connect to us and follow David's work um, elsewhere on the uh, Citizen Network website. Thanks a lot. Thank you.